Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session four of the International Symposium on Biological Science. I'm Jacqueline Alves Leite. I am a professor at the Federal University of Goiás. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce you to, the, to Dr. Like Hartman, Dr. Karen Like Hartman. Dr. Karen is associate professor in the Department of Biomedicine at Aarhus University in Denmark and she is investigating how dormant follicles are activated and she also is research new strategies associated to reproduction and ovarian follicle development. Dr. Kari is an expert in genetic manipulation and pioneer in the development of two mouse models related to disease that affect the function of sodium potassium TPAs such as alternating childhood hemiplegia and familial hemiplegic migraine. They are associated with mutation in the alpha-3 and alpha-2 subunity of sodium potassium TPAs, respectively. Thank you, Dr. Karin, for accepting our invitation. We are looking forward to hear from you uh, about female repro reproduction. Uh, so feel free to start your talk and please take your time. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction, Jacqueline. It's uh, really great to see you again. And uh, I'm really pleased we had this pass going on on the sodium potassium problem and all the mouse modeling. But I will not be talking about this project today. As you know, my, my life has already uh, had a little female reproduction in it. And I will be talking about that today. So can you see my screen? Here we go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You see it? We can, yes, we can see your screen and see you and hear you. Perfect. All right. Well, so again, thank you for inviting me to talk about this female reproduction, which is a project very close to my heart. And uh, as Jacqueline already said, my name is Karin Lüger Hartmann. I'm a professor at the Department of Biomedicine here at Aarhus University in Denmark. And uh, to all of you, uh, please feel free to reach out to me after this uh, presentation. So first, I want to give a, a short introduction to reproductive endocrinology that regulate ovarian follicle and development. During the fertile age, the gonadotrophin-releasing hormone is a master hormone regulating uh, reproduction and is released in a positive manner from the hypothalamus. It then transports through the portal system um, um, to reach the anterior pit pituitary, uh, where it binds the receptors on the gonadotrophin cells. Once it binds the receptor in these cells, it starts a cascade, which will synthesize and release the luteinizing hormone LH and the follicle-stimulating hormone uh, FSH. So I will use LH and FSH to, to, uh, to refer to these hormones. And the receptors for these hormones are found on the ovarian cells, in the tiga cells and the granulosa cells down here on the, on the follicles. And this trigger a lot of... Uh, of, of signaling which will end up producing the progesterone and also the androgens and also importantly in this manner the estrogen and the estrogen and these uh, sex hormones they stimulate the follicle development and also the maturation of these uh, follicles that go through this ovarian cycle and then finally you will have the release of a mature egg also, it's quite uh, established how the progesterone and the estrogen uh, uh, exert the negative feedback to keep this uh, loop regulated. So this is kind of the extremely basic uh, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, reproductive endocrinology in, in the female uh, system. So when you look at the ovarian um, follicle development, which is also referred to as the folliculo genesis, it can actually be divided into two phases. If you look over here, you have this pool of primordial follicles that constitutes the, the, the female capacity for fertility. Uh, and uh, and it, on a monthly basis, a little cohort of these uh, uh, primordial follicles are activated and turn into primary follicles. And they can stay dormant for many, many years before they actually get activated. Then they start their, this competitive journal of, uh, of growing and maturation, and only one will end up to be, be the one that releases uh, a mature egg, as is, uh, is shown here. 
And this whole ovarian cycle can be divided into a gonadotropin independent and dependent phase. And this is uh, quite important because when you look at the treatment offered today to infertile patients uh, who suffer from some kind of ovarian uh, dysfunction, they get only one treatment. And this is a standard hormone treatment which, which only helps those follicles that are responsive to hormones. And that is from the secondary stages. And this is actually what prompted our project initially is, is to look at, you know, what, what do these follicles actually um, respond to if they don't respond to, to hormones? And this actually was sort of, you know, in a very brief frame here, what made us start looking at that. And if you look into the primordial follicles and the more into the signaling, it's already known that in dormant follicles, this is what this off refers to, that is not activated. Um, you have the P10, which is one of the gatekeeper of this dormancy that keeps this pathway inactive. Once you get a stimulation from uh, the kid ligand, which is secreted from the surrounding pregranulosa cells, you activate this pathway and you will end up having a phosphorylation of the act. This act has several, this phosphorylator act has several sort of activation steps. It can remove the inhibitory effect uh, of uh, the TSC1 and 2, which releases the TOR complex to be active, and it also can travel into the nucleus and remove. Um, P27 and FOXO3A, which, which exert some inhibitory effects on the growth. And these are kind of known, but still we were knowing from, from many other manipulation essays that there must be other players that, that, that are important in this stage. And this was actually sort of a very simple question. What else is happening within the primordial follicle that would allow us to regulate them? So we started this uh, some years back and we got a lot of tissues from the hospital and we cut it into pieces and then uh, we, uh, we uh, put them into slides and then we laser capture them using this uh, LCM machine. So basically what it does is that you stage the primordial follicle or the primary follicle extremely careful. And as is shown over here in a more schematic view, you can see that there's quite some significant difference between these two stages. So the primordial has these very flat pregranulosa cells encapsulating the oocyte, whereas the primary has this more cubic uh, 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 granulosa cells and also the oocyte has grown in size. So we started collecting all these from, from different patients uh, that we got tissue from. And then we, um, we asked what kind of molecular markers do they express. So we did this and then we started doing RNA sequencing on these very um, distinct pools of uh, either the oocyte or the whole follicle, including the granulosa cells. So this is what it looks like. So when you, when you look at the images taken from the laser capture microscope, they're not the best because this is, this is a microscope that has been designed to laser capture them. But here you see an example of a primordial follicle. Then you encircle them by the laser uh, using the program and then afterwards you collect your sample. And then uh, this was done really careful to discriminate between the primordial and the primary. And when uh, one of uh, a student started to collect these, you know, from different patients with a lot of different numbers, you can see, you know, several hundred for some of the, of the samples were collected uh, this way. And then we sequence them using 12 different libraries and we start mapping them and then we started annotating them into the human uh, reference genome and then we normalized them and transferred them into the log2 uh, values. And then we started to look at what is going on in these uh, cells and in the dormant cell are there you know anything that is that's really uh, could pinpoint what kind of uh, signaling we could we could you know, communicate with these dormant follicles. And here is just a little bit, the first part is just a little bit of the summers, how we annotated them, mapping them and filtered them. And then we started to look at into what is actually significantly expressed in these different single cell compartments. Uh, so that, that what we did was to make sure that there was no um, differences between the patients, but they were all the same. And then we started to look at how many genes would fulfill these criteria, And then we started to look at what is exactly the, the, um, the difference between 
for instance, here for the granulosa cells that are surrounding the primordial to the granulosa cells when they are uh, surrounding the primary cells. And then we just started to do all these different kind of analysis, up-regulated, down-regulated from the granulosa cells, all the oocytes as well. And then we found all the components and we tried to put them into uh, signaling pathways, figuring out what kind of signaling pathways are actually active once you start to uh, tra transit from the primordial to the primary follicles. And then we found a lot of different hits. Uh, that's what you always do when you make these global analysis. You're always uh, finding a lot of uh, interesting things. And then we thought, okay, let, let's do some functional testing about this and set up some kind of pharmacological testing of the pathways using an in vitro-based system. So we use mouse uh, mostly as our model system. And uh, we took out the ovaries, put them into inserts, grow them with or without a drug that could hit a, a specific component of a pathway that would either work as an agonist or an antagonist. And then after some titrating with time and concentration, we sliced the ovaries and then we just started really counting, you know, what kind of effect could this drug have on how this first initial a step in folliculogenesis was uh, regulated, and we just counted the, either the primordial and the primary and secondary follicles, and we only counted follicles where the nucleus was visible to ensure that we didn't count uh, them more than once. And then we just started this quite systematic drug in the beginning, uh, uh, testing of the drugs in the beginning, just titration in time and concentration. And we ended up with, with, with some extremely interesting targets of how we could actually communicate with these dormant follicles. And I'm just going to show a little bit example of how we assess what's happening once we start to manipulate these uh, follicles, which uh, became really interesting. And so, so one of the things that we do is that we treat them and then we look for apoptosis. You know, are there are they any increased apoptosis that, that kind of... Um, suggest that it's it's not really good for the cell. And then we also look at the diameters because some of the drugs that we tested for different pathways were so, you know, powerful that some of the ozone almost, you know, blew up. And then, of course, it's it's not really good for, for the cell. We also looked at mitochondrial membrane potential to see if there was any problems in the energy sources or the uh, uh, oxidation. Uh, oxidative species, the reactive oxidative species, you know, so that would sort of indicate that there was any oxidative stress going on. And we found for some of the drugs and some of the pathways, this was not compatible with a very good uh, oocyte quality. And that would never, you know, potentially be able to be translated into a clinical uh, uh, use. But then we have <clears throat> some drugs that actually showed that, that they were actually compatible with an extremely high quality of the egg. So we then, uh, after we have been treating some of the, <clears throat> sorry, some of the follicles, we also went on to sequence uh, single cells from these using the same approach. And I, as I showed before, to see what kind of, you know, molecular changes could we put onto the cell and are there indications that we have uh, disturbed any hormonal uh, interference. And it, some of them just showed a really, really nice and clean profile. So what the next was is once we uh, have been looking at all these parameters, they all look fine. We couldn't see it. And we, of course, what is really important is to see that, that once you treat the eggs, you can actually get a, to produce an, a, a litter out of it. And we did that in different ways. And I'm just going to not spend that much time on, on this, but just to show that we took out the ovaries, put them in the culture with the drug or without the drug. Then we uh, <clears throat> grow them as, as they come bigger in the follicle size that need a different support and then we grow them in a, in a different media setup to to make sure that can develop these uh, granulosa cells and then once they read the enteral uh, part we uh, hormone treat them to 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 form this uh, mature egg this is a metaphase egg then we did uh, an IVF on them to see that they could actually be fertile after being treated with the drug uh, and then we uh, some of those that we uh, did for IVF we put into the incubator and we followed the growth all the way up uh, during the pre-implantation stage to the blastocyst stage. And some of them we took at the two cell state and transferred back into a female recipient to see if they could also generate leaders after this treatment. And this was really nice to see that it was possible and we got a really nice result having this. And we also uh, did it with some really old mice, which will mimic uh, some of these um, 
patient that could eventually uh, benefit from a, from a new treatment of this. And we saw that when we use this, uh, some of these drugs, we actually get a significant increase in generating mature eggs. We also um, looked at the uh, morphology of these uh, blastocysts and, and they seem to be the same in both groups. We went back and tested it on some uh, tissue we got from patients. And we can see here that uh, there are some uh, sections here that shows uh, the human tissue, which is a little bit different from the mouse tissue. And when we treat them with different uh, drugs, we can actually see that we can enhance the activation of the primordial follicles. So now this tissue uh, we got from different patients that are infertile from the hospital and they're still infertile, but, but, but we definitely see the the clinical perspective in, in uh, developing this method because now we can generate um, follicles from uh, from this tissue. So this uh, all in all has been uh, quite an, uh, a nice journey for us to, to go through this stage and just uh, because time is running I can see I will uh, go through the summary and perspective just to say that we have identified pathways that can regulate this uh, this first hormone independent transition going from primordial to primary transition. We also did some functional testing to show uh, that we could actually uh, target different kind of uh, pathways to uh, to enhance this activation and didn't really affect the uh, equality. Some of them did, but not all of them. And we could also generate uh, litters uh, in vivo. And it also was uh, translating back to uh, human tissue that we got from infertile patients. And now we are addressing uh, different pathways to see what are, are the, the mechanism of action for these drugs and how, how does that translate into something that could eventually move forward for a, for a new uh, infertility treatment. So I'll just end up with uh, thanking the team at Aarhus University, uh, Department of Biomedicine. Uh, some of the key players are listed over here. We have Mahmoubea Mushahi, who is an assistant professor in the lab. Erik Ernst and Emil Hagen, who are the medical doctors helping to uh, to collect the, the tissue from the hospital. And then we also have Anas, who is a lab manager. And of course, we have a, a lot of student, students, PhD students, medical students and master students who are helping with all kinds of, uh, of testing uh, of these uh, projects. So that was, uh, that was it for me. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. So please feel free to follow up afterwards as well. Yeah. Thank you, Karin, Karin, for your wonderful talk. It's also it's all always nice uh, to learn with you about science, about different <laughs> uh, talks in the science. Um, it's it's too new for me, okay? But I know this is nice new, and it to, has nothing to, to do with the project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have one question. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I have. Sorry, Kari. Yes. Sorry, I think we have some connection problem. Yes, we I hear don't... you now. Yeah, I, I can see you and hear you perfect now. Okay, so I just uh, say that it's uh, a little bit uh, uh, different for me because it's a completely different that they are area that. We work together, yeah, but it's so interesting area. And I think we, we can try to do collaborate with this top. Yes, uh, that would be really as nice. As soon as possible. Yeah, that yeah. would be really nice. So, uh, but I have some, I, I have one question about this because Hi, Professor Karin. Sorry, we are having some uh, connection problems. Yeah. Let's That's see okay. if Jacqueline can deal with this problem. 
just just Sorry, i heard the first days. part and then it was kind of lost yeah but, yeah <laughs> well that's okay so uh, i know that it's always a challenge with these things <laughs> okay yeah. uh, i'm going to to see uh i can see some questions here professor karen um so before that thank you for this beautiful presentation karen very interesting so let me see here so we have a, a question from Ericles Mesquita mm -hmm. he thanks for the lecture uh, and he says I would like to ask if the oxidative stress is asso associated with infertility well, there's a lot of different theories about this. This is why we're really careful to try and measure some of these parameters because it has been shown that it can affect infertility if you are going through a lot of oxidative stress. But mostly these are quite age-related uh, when the repair mechanism in the eggs are reducing themselves to go through this. And I think a lot of effort has been tried to go through this uh, to kind of treat infertility, but it has not really been, been the way to go forward. So it has been, um, and it's a really good question because a lot of people have tried to really target a lot of different things. Also going through this ACT pathway and the P10 pathway, which I, I started to show, but it actually turns out to, to really um, put a lot of stress on the follicle and especially uh, m manipulating a bit with the DNA quality. So that we found that the repair mechanism has been has been shown not to be function very well once you go into to, to these kind of different uh, drugs. So it is a really, really fine balance that you have to find here. And, and oxidative is, stress is, really, is truly a concern in this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ericles also asks is, and the use of natural products with potential antioxidants could help yeah. to treat infertility? Well, some people have tried that, but I think because they are so all over you, I mean, they, they, they're not a specific target, right? So they're a little bit, you know, potentially uh, targeting a lot of things. It has not really been shown to be very effective, not to my knowledge, at least. <laughs> okay, okay. Jacqueline is back. Go ahead, Jacqueline. It's up to you. Thank okay. You <laughs> Thank you, Professor Manuel. I'm sorry, I have some problem with my internet okay. here. But I just, I, I have one question uh, because uh, several diseases have a, like a chronic inflammatory. And I just want to know if the, this chronic inflammatory that presents in this disease, like obesity or hypertension, could be, in, uh, could be, do some influence in follicle development or I mean, of follicle yeah. dynamics. So, yeah, well, actually, I skipped the slide showing a little bit of different side of disease coming into the infertility because, you know, of the time. But I think if you are in the obesity category, your your follicle development is is sort of affected in a different way. Many of these Many of these patients will also suffer from PCOS, which is quite a different disease. Our aim is to go more for the low ovarian reserve patient, those who are either premature or um, age-related, because then you do not really benefit from the uh, hormone treatment today because either you you don't have any secondary follicles because your reserve is low or you don't really tolerate the, the oh. treatment because you already have endogenous uh, levels of FSAs that are too high to, for you to tolerate it. When you have obesity, it, it's a different problem. And, and that's going through a little bit in the insulin risk, you know, that you have this insulin resistance and it also affects a bit the way that you synthesize the androgen pathway. So you get much more sort of these androgen into your system. So the phenotype will be slightly different. You do have a lot of follicles and you can actually activate it, but they do not develop. Right, they get into these more cystic. If you go into the inflammation, it's a complete, it, it's a really different area and it's a huge area. And we also try to look a, slightly on this and we looked at some of the toll receptors because they're quite highly expressed. And we thought, you know, either it, it's just because it's ready to combat or because that it's, it's wanting to do uh, something else. And, and we could not really figure out, but it definitely is ready to combat. So if we, if we challenge the old side with some, we know some uh, antigens, it definitely is alert immediately. 
and if you have these inflammatory diseases it, it might be that that you kind of stop the activation a bit not because you have low reserve mm -hmm. but because your system is taken over by this uh, inflammatory pathways so they're a little bit different sort of etiologies to how you become infertile so it, it's some really complex areas, and especially when you come to the PCOS, because the endocrinology is a little bit complex uh, with the antigens. But yeah, quite exciting. <laughs> okay, it's, it's really exciting to to study more about this this topic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think really? and it will also be relevant for the systems eventually, like everything else in the body, right? It can translate, you know, but you just find the systems to look in, yeah. Exactly. We have a lot of uh, questions here. I think we have more time. So the the questions, uh, the second questions come from from Ellen, Ellen yeah. Christina. Uh, Ellen uh, asked if maybe uh, she missed it, but did your group also uh, proceed to in vitro culture of human follicles or own rodent? Yeah. Well, we do process human uh, tissue in the lab now and i know this is another extremely big area in the fertility world because you know the the clinical uh, <laughs> uh, perspective in being able to mature human follicles in which is huge so the ibm protocols are definitely uh, something that is on on many people's uh, list of things to do and accomplish and it's extremely tricky because the rodent has been done for years and it's it can be done, you know, with a few techniques, but it doesn't really translate very well with the human tissue. And it's extremely difficult. And of course, it comes to the end, you know, you cannot really test the quality of the eggs because you're not allowed to do IVF just to check it for the humans with, you know, for ethical reasons. But it, it's an extremely difficult protocol, but we do it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Carrie. Uh, the next question is also from Eileen. She yeah. has also are human samples obtained from healthy patients or was there any disease associated to the samples and she say, said that thank you very much for your lectures <laughs> you're welcome so it yeah so when we when we started this uh, project trying to look into the molecular maps of these primordial and primary follicles we took it from healthy patients so patients who did not have any diseases related to the ovaries so most of them had the has had their ovaries removed because they were going into chemotherapy for another cancer disease we can of, of course not exclude you know that there might be something but on the ovary side they look normal so once they have been cured so what you do is you take out the ovaries you cryopreserve them once the female has been uh, cured for the cancer uh, we can actually put the ovaries back into her and then she will actually start cycling so it's really amazing uh, and it was uh, one of the procedures that was actually pioneered here at Aarhus University Hospital uh, some years back and some of the first women who had their ovaries transplanted back after being cured from the cancer has already had children so that's quite significant once we started to test some of the theories we had on these things different things uh, they're not published yet so it you know we are just checking up a few things uh, they are we took the tissue from infertile patients suffering from the premature ovarian insufficiency uh, PUI patients to see that it could have an effect of those who, who have a really low ovarian reserve yes Thank you, Karen. I think we have more time for one question. Uh, the next question comes from Paolo Gedini. Um, he said, he asked if, um, if you saw some markers of oxid oxidative stress in the, in the experiment. Yeah, I only showed some of the analysis we did, and we and, and we did a lot of different analysis. Some of the sort of more general ones that we have used was to look at the mitochondrial uh, membrane potential. It actually says if the mitochondria start to get stressed, and you will immediately see a difference in this uh, membrane potential. We also used the ROS assay, as you know, for reactive oxygen species, to see if there was any um, differences in this. And then, of course, we look at tunnel assay, which will... Uh, to show you if there's any increased apoptosis because you know if this is going to be eventually trans 
palatable into a, a fertility treatment. You want the egg to be superb, right? You don't want them to have any uh, apoptosis. We also looked at the BSBCL2 and the box markers I didn't show you here. And we have also been sequencing, RNA sequencing, all of the stages throughout the development, uh, single cell from RNA sequencing. And this is what we are analyzing right now. And that will tell you really in details what's going on in each cell after they have been treated. So so we are not quite finished that analysis yet. It's actually still ongoing. And some of them we are repeating now. We had a laser that broke from the microscope. You all know that you know, <laughs> these technical problems always happens when you don't want them to happen. So we had to fix the laser and now we are you know, collecting the last cells, and uh, it's always like this when you do science, right? So, and and, that, and uh, for us, it's really, really important that we have all these quality markers, you know, ticked off, uh, combined with with more functional data to to show what's going on. So, yes. Mm. Thank you, Kay. Uh, we have, I think, we have time for one more question. Uh, the yeah. questions come comes from Ericlis. And he uh, asked about the association of environment pollution and future infertility and how to protect against this kind of stress. Uh, once we have a lot of uh, toxic agents such as aluminum. Yeah, I mean, this is a really good question. And we, uh, it, it's a lot in the, I think it's a lot in the, in the news lately right with all these uh, you know potential pollutions that can affect the fertility and that goes for male and for female both of us you know the, the sexes were constantly being exposed to all kind of pollutions and and, and and so on and we also see there's a great increase in infertility in both sexes because of this all the plastic hormone disturbing uh, drugs and you know toxic agents, aluminum, and all these kind of things. I don't know how we protect ourselves from that. I really don't know. I think we really have to be conscious about how we live lives uh, in general and, and how you how you take care of yourself. So I, I don't really have a solution to that. And, and I know many people are, are, are doing a lot of this, uh, did a lot of this research. So and I just can just see the last question of Ellen, who came back with this from Telfer's group. Uh, I don't know if you had tried that protocol. Uh, but if you have, uh, I think uh, this protocol needs a lot of optimization because I know that group very well, of course, and I also know of her work. But the protocol needs a lot of optimization to uh, to be robust. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kai. This it's a really good question that Eric is uh, do. Uh, yeah, Manuel, I yeah, I, Manuel, I don't know if you have some time for more one question. Yes, yes, Jacqueline, we have time for questions. Go, go ahead, okay. Jacqueline. I, I, I think that, okay. I think the next, next question, I don't know if it's from Eileen. Uh, yeah, but I took Eileen it a little bit. Yeah, speak. yeah, yeah. Because I thought you said you only have, have time for one more. I just, you know, I can see she's answering. Also, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, it's it's not like it has not one that's one protocol being published, but it's not a very good protocol. Well, I'm really happy to know if it's working for you, but for sure it's not working for us. That protocol is uh, is a little bit, uh, yeah, needs some optimization, oh, okay. <laughs> if you want to <laughs> phrase it that way. Uh, and we, are, we are definitely making our own protocol at the moment for this, yeah, you know, for the human tissue. Yeah. Okay, it's just a comment that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I just want to make sure you know because often you think if something is published, you know, it's going to work fine, the problem is solved. It's far from the case, right? In many cases, you know, maybe it worked once, you know, and this is it's not a very efficient uh, protocol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I think with I think we don't have more time for questions. Uh, so thank you, Karen, for your joy with us this morning. Of course. Uh, it was really nice to see you again. See and, you again? Uh, I hope I can soon come to visit you again. Yeah, <laughs> I, I also hope. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to <laughs> uh, visit Aarhus University again and maybe uh, being in your lab for some, some time. Um, thank you for your wonderful talk. 
Uh, and if you want to join with us here, just uh, just just be here. Okay. Uh, the, the next, uh, so we will move for the next talk, and the next talk will be coordinated by Professor Manuel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Giacolini. And before starting our next presentation, I'd like to, to thank you again, Professor Karen, for this beautiful, amazing presentation and for uh, the very interesting discussion about this topic. Thank you. Thank you again, Karen. So let's go to our next section, our next presentation, who is going to be delivered by Professor Claudio Barbeito. First of all, Professor, I would like to thank you very much for joining us during our International Symposium on Biological Sciences. Professor Claudio Barbeito is PhD in Veterinary Sciences. Uh, he's professor of histology and embryology and general pathology uh, in the School of Veterinary Sciences in National University of La Plata, Argentina. He is a, a principal investigator of National Council for Scientific Research and Technological Extension. He also has uh, 867 papers in index setting scopus about histology, pathology, and development of vertebrates, mainly in reproduction aspects. He also has 25 supervised doctor, uh, doctoral theses. Professor Claudio, again, Thank you very much for being so kind and for having accepted the invitation to be here. It's an honor having you here. So feel free to start your lecture when you want. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to thank the organizer for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today I will talk about the plains Biscachas Lagostomus Maximus, female prostate. In particular, I will discuss what is different and what is shared when compared to other mammals. I have been working on this topic for some years ago uh, together with Alicia Flamini and Enrique Portiansky in the University of La Plata in Argentina. So, who are the plain biscacha? They belong to a stricognatic group. They are rodents similar to capybaras and guinea pigs that live in communal burrows systems in groups known as biscacheras. Here is Lagostomus maximus. Uh, they have some unique reproductive fissures that are not present in other Eucerian mammals. They have polyvulation and produce around 200 to 800 oocytes. Uh, from them, only 10 to 12 finally result in implantation and only two pup are born from them. These successful embryos are those placed in the most caudal position in each uterine horn. The rest of them are reabsorbed in some moment between gestational day uh, 26 and 70. So, how did uh, 
we were interested in the female prostate of these animals. Some years ago, Alicia Flamini was working on her PhD thesis under my supervision. She was interested in the reproductive system of Lagostomus maximus. One day, we were at the lab and she called me to show me something on the microscope, this image. She asked me to tell her what it was. Immediately, I said, it's a prostate. And so she moved to another part of the same slide and showed me this. And what is this? Well, it seemed to be a vagina. So we were surprised, of course. We had read some mentions to a prostate gland in female, but never seen in real life. We revised all the samples we had, and in all females, there was prostate. Amazing. So the next was, uh, so the next step was to carry out an extensive search for references. So, what we found in this search, in the beginning of the 20, uh, the 20th century, Rauter observed the presence of a well-developed prostate in the rodent arbicantis cinereus females. Some years later, Mark noted the existence of prostatic lobes in the female rat. The, uh, by the time Dinley found this gland in some insectivores like the hedgehog. And Price and Mahony showed that these glands arose at bottom the ventrolateral walls of the urogenital sinus. Uh, there were reports that in some species, such as oak, rudiments of this gland are occasionally found. But in any other istricognati rodent, this gland was found up to here. When we expanded the search to know what happened in humans, we found that it was the graph who uh, described the gland in human for the first time and introduced the term corpus glanduloso or female prostate. The father of the pathology, uh, Bircho, described female women uh, prostate as a genito urinary organ. And also, he was the first to describe corpora milaceae similar to those of the male prostate. In 1880, Skene identified in human two large ducts and named this structure Skene gland or ducts. This name is no longer used because, as you saw, the, uh, he was not the first to describe human female prostate. Skene emphasized the role of this gland in some infect, in some infections of the female reproductive uh, systems and introduced the term skenitis. We are ready to come back to the 20th century and in the 80s, Milan Saviasic started to study the gland in humans. Years and years of work give to his book, The Human Female Prostate. There, he stated from the human female prostate was a functional genitourinary organ. A 
Milan is a forensic pathology that has some controversial ideas. For instance, that this gland corresponds to the she spot in woman. He uh, also carried out study on the chemical composition using histoenzymatic and immunohistochemistry techniques. These are photos that the studies I was talking about, he found that in the adenomers of the gland, they were cells expressing some molecules that are the same as in male, for instance, the acid phosphatase. It was found in human at different ages. Um, they also found reactivity for the prostate antigen. It was key in forensic science because some of these molecules were used as evidence of rape, since they, since are, they are present in the pre-ejaculatory liquid. So, this finding forced to a revision of the use of them as evidence of rape by its own. Some uh, later studies found that, that in some animals, such as a rat, the gland is constant and has similarity with the human female prostate, as well as with the male gland in the same species. In this study, the use of immunohistochemistry revealed the presence of prostatic specific uh, antigen and prostatic specific fosfatase. So here you have some of our first contribution. We performed macroanatomical and histological description regarding histology. You use, we, we use traditional techniques such as hematoxylin and eosin, trichromic techniques, silver staining or thin staining to observe elastic fibers and other techniques such as us. We found that in the plain Vizcacha, the prostate is placed around, around the uretra. This is uretra, this is prostate gland. Uretra, duct, of the gland, adenomers of the gland. It has a lobular pattern. We can see the different lobes, lobule. It's formed by alveolar adenomers, alveolar adenomers, with a secretory aspect, which is uh, confirmed by the presence of secretion in the lumen. There are also corpora amylaceae, similar to those found in the male and female of other species. Finally, the ducts finish it in the uretra in two main ducts that go independently to the uretra. In the first year of the 20th century, 21th century, excuse me, the group of Dr. Taboga, in which Professor Manuel participated, started studies on female prostate of Charbils uh, 
meriones ungiculatus, other murida rodent, as a rat with a constant female prostate. They demonstrated that also in this species there are morphological and biochemical similarities between male and female prostate. Also, they found an effect of strong uh, progesterone, uh, uh, testosterone on the gland. And also, they found, found an um, action of endocrine disruptor as the bifenol, bifenol A. So this group also studied some aspect of prostate development and found homology between female prostate and the ventral lobe in the male. Finally, they also found that pregnancy produced chain in the gland related to an increase in seric progesterone. So coming back, coming back to our work, after the first result, for some years, we left the study of female prostate of the Vizcacha to dedicate to other organs of this animal, the placenta, for instance. And then we came back to the prostate. We applied not only technique of traditional optic microscopy, but also lectin histochemistry, immunohistochemistry, and electron microscopy. Our aim was to describe more deeply this gland and to compare pregnant and no pregnant females. Um, so, um, we found that pregnant and no pregnant female have a similar aspect when observed in the optic microscope. Here are pregnant, here non-pregnant. Also, we corroborate that in the stroma, uh, there are smooth muscle fiber as observed using antibody anti uh, This was found in pregnant and no pregnant female. Positive nuclei uh, were found uh, detecting PCNA as a marker of proliferation uh, cellular. Um, here in the pregnant group, uh, we found more nuclei uh, positive to PCNA. There are pregnant, there are non-pregnant. Using the picosirius technique, we found the picosirius to determine collagen fibers. Um, we found that in pregnant and no pregnant females, the stroma has mainly type 1 pregnant not pregnant, type 1, and to lesser type 3, is difficult to see, difficult to see, in a similar amount uh, in, bo in both groups. We use uh, lectin histochemistry to detect a specific carbohydrate that are present in glycoproteins. Here was a clear difference between pregnant and no pregnant females with a stronger, more sanded and varied 
staining in the pregnant females. Using scanning electron microscopy, uh, observe epithelial projection here in pregnant, in non-pregnant, with a connective axis that form the adenomers of this gland. This observation was shared in, by the two groups. Also, uh, also with uh, transmission electronic uh, microscopy, we found cell with a secretory aspect, secretory aspect in pregnant and no pregnant. You can see the granules, granules, there was abundant rough reticulum, endoplasmic reticulum here, but by example, for example, and a Golgi complex here in both group. Uh, we also found some clear cells clear cells that could be intermediate cells described also in humans and that were interpreted as a transition between basal and tall cells. Uh, another thing is a, a confirmation that the epithelium is pseudo-stratified. Pseudo-stratified epithelium with basal cell that are the positive to P, C, N, E, A. There are the basal cells. Well, to conclude, we found that the female prostate of the Vizcacha shares some features with other species. We found a pseudostratified epithelium with basal cells with a proliferative activity, as in the male, the female has smooth muscle tissue in the stroma. Tall cells have an ultrastructural and histochemical characteristic that indicate secretory activity increases during pregnancy. Our works leave some perspective to continue. Uh, for instance, something interest, interesting is that we did not find reactivity to prostatic antigen, something that is common in other species, but it's important to remark that in male prostate of Lagostomus maximus, we did find reactivity in Vizcacha specimens. Another thing, how is development in Lagostomus maximus? Is there homology between ventral lobe of the male and female prostate also in this species? Another question, up to hear the functionality of this gland. Is it now for female mammals? Mammals, if it has any function. In Sherville's, it was found a stimulant effect of progesterone. It is interesting because the Vizcachas during pregnancy have several corpora lutea. In fact, they have a process of pseudo-ovulation during the pregnancy that increases more the number of corpora lutea. In the future, it will be interesting to study the link between progesterone levels and change in secretory cells in the female prostate. Well, uh, 
this is the group uh, that work with the Vizcacha's prostate, I, Enrique Portiansky, Alicia Flamini, she was uh, uh, your uh, doctoral thesis uh, about, the, about the reproductive system of the Vizcacha, Eduardo Jimeno in the first, in the initial studies, um, Alcira Díaz performed the histochemical uh, study in the last paper, and Francisco Acuña, he is continuing the research about this gland. Thank you, and excuse me by my English, that is not well, it's bad. Thank you very much, Professor Claudio. Please don't worry about uh, English language. And I know I'm a very uh, suspect to say that your lecture was very interesting. And it was, of course, very interesting and very beautiful because I work with female prostate, you know, very well. And also, Professor Claudio, very beautiful your images from female prostate tissue using different techniques. Very beautiful. So we have time for questions. Let's see what we have in our chat. So, okay. Uh, Fernanda, Fernanda Cristina, prof, Professor Fernanda Cristina Alcântara dos Santos is asking, First, he says, thank you very much for the lecture, Dr. Claudio Barbeito. The question is, does plain viscacha develop oh. lesions in female prostate as well as other rodents? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Fernanda. Uh, we don't found a lesion in the female prostate. Um, we uh, saw uh, 100 uh, prostate of discacha, uh, of female discacha, and uh, any lesion was found. Very interesting, Professor. Uh, but uh, these animals, these animals are um, uh, captured, uh, not are in bioterium, bioterio. Not, uh, no son animales criados para uh, el trabajo. Uh, en, uh, entonces, uh, son capturados. Y nunca en alrededor de 100 animales hemos encontrado lesiones. Very interesting, Professor Cloud, because it, for gerbil, gerbils is are it, it is very different because female gerbil uh, has it's very common to find le lesions uh, lesions, especially in older animals. It's interesting. Professor Fernanda also asks: Is, is playing Viscacha a good model to access the effects of endocrine disruptors on the female prostate? Bueno, like uh, the problem is uh, very difficult um, um, criar uh, Viscachas in in cautiverio. It's es muy difícil poder criarlas en cautiverio, because she lives in the vizcacheras, in a deeply cavern, eh, and eh, una sola vez eh, la profesora Flamini could eh, have eh, eh, vizcachas, eh, vizcacha reproduction in eh, cautiveri eh, es muy difícil entonces eh, voy a tratar de contestarla en español eh, para usarla como modelo de disruptor endocrino, endocrino se complica mucho eh, 
uno debe tener la hembra en, en jaulas y en general eh, no se preñan, y no pregnan en eh, eh, cage. cage. Eh, sería muy, muy interesante, very interesting, eh, because the Vizcacha have many other particularity in eh, eh, is reproduction, as the polyovulation, the resorption eh, and the effect of endocrine disruptor could be very, uh, very interesting. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. We have more questions. Um, Edivaldo Mendes, uh, he first thanks you for the excellent presentation. Uh, and he asks, do you have uh, any hypothesis about the role of the female prostate uh, in reproduction? <laughs> This is a one million question. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, could be lubrication uh, or uh, uh, generate uh, Uh, close uh, to the uh, vagina, but because it's the only rodent of the istricognati group, because the rat have constant uh, gland and uh, mice, uh, mouse not have the gland because uh, the chinchilla, the chinchilla in the Uh, same family that the Vizcacha have not the gland. Uh, in the human, uh, uh, Sabiasic uh, considered the possibility that the gland is a she spot, but in uh, the animals, uh, is it, it is possible. Uh, But, the, uh, but with lectin histochemistry, we found a great variety uh, of um, carbohydrate uh, and indicate uh, a, variety, a variety of um, glycoproteins. But the function uh, could be very interesting to uh, make a proteomic study of the gland. Yes, yes. I, I, I would say that this question is the one million question <laughs> for us that the male prostate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we have more questions uh, from Jessica Souza. Uh, she says, this model appears to have more uh, pleated epithelium uh, that enfoldings of the epithelium layer than the model you, used by Professor Manuel. Uh, is there a yes, difference uh, in gland Jessica, secretion? Yes. Yes, uh, Jessica. Uh, one difference with the model of Professor Manuel is that they uh, found that progesterone not stimulates the um, cell proliferation in the gland. And In Vizcacha, the pregnant female have more um, uh, PCNA uh, marker cells. Uh, it's a difference. Uh, and other difference, we cannot explain this, is the uh, negativity to the prostatic specific antigen. Uh, In all the species, uh, cervil, rat, human, uh, the gland uh, is positive as a male. In Vizcacha, it's positive in the male, but not in uh, the female. Uh, it's very um, strange. 
Thank you, Professor. We have another question from our audience. Uh, Natani Ribeiro Lima. She thanks you a lot for the amazing lecture. Uh, her question is, what, what's the function uh, or what's the importance uh, of the acid phosphatase in the female prostate? No, it's not known uh, because it's not known the, the function. It uh, could be that any function have an is a vestigial organ um, because um, there are a very interesting study in the uh, vesicle in the um, um, vesicula biliar uh, bilis uh, organ that bilis production that is present in uh, it, it, that bilis um, have uh, the um, ay, bile glad, uh, gladder, vesicula biliar, I uh, don't, don't remember the name, that a gene uh, is not present in the rat and the organ not develop. I uh, think that in, the, uh, in this case, could be that a, an effect that inhibit the development of the gland in most uh, females, in some species, the, the gen, I don't know which, is not explicit. And uh, the gland develop as in the male. Uh, it could be that the gland have any function uh, and is a, a vestigial organ. Thank you, Professor. Um, professor Claudio, you told your group um, have analyzed 800 viscaccia. It is a lot of uh, animals. Uh, it is possible to find prostate in all females. I'm asking this because for for gerbils, it's easy to find female prostate. I would say that almost 100% of females have prostate, like we 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 know that happens in women. But for example, if you we try to do this using rats i mean with rats it's very complicated because most females most uh, females of rats don't have prostate you know and about viscaccia is um, I don't not hear uh, Manuel. Ah, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, professor. I'm going to, to to ask you again. Can you hear me? Is a uh, the internet is uh, oh, uh, is okay. complicated. I don't uh, it cut. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Could, uh, let me try another another question. Can you hear me? Yes. Now. Now, see, yes, yes. Okay, okay, professor. Uh, did you did you perform measures of the epithelial height um, in in the female prostate of that pregnancy to to see if the epithelial layer is higher? Uh, is a, a, a future a, a research. A, we return the prostate study a, because a, Alicia Flamini was a, making a performing your thesis about 
other the reproductive organs. Uh, we uh, study uh, the placenta and the embryo death and resorption, because that is very interesting. And we pu uh, published uh, four papers in the last uh, years, and now we are um, making new um, um, work about the prostate. Uh, we uh, are designing um, experiment using um, morphometric techniques, comparing a, a different state, and uh, we um, go to um, immuno um, histochemistry um, application of um, receptor to androgen and to progesterone uh, to see change in pregnant and not pregnant. Very, very nice. And in it's different moments of the pregnancy. Yes, yes. It's good to know about that, Professor. So, Professor Claudio, we do not have more questions. And in fact, you have to, to follow to the next section, uh, to the next presentation, sorry, yeah. of, our, of our section. So again, Professor, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, very much for being here and for having contributed a lot for improving our understanding of the, the female prostate. Thank you very much. So now we are going to to follow with our next presentation. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Paul Pergesi. First of all, Professor, I'd like to thank you very much for being here and for having accepted the invitation to join us during our International Symposium on Biological Sciences. Professor Paul Pergesi graduated in pharmacy from the University of Swigert. He bagged his PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry at Albert St. George University. He is a member of the Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee, Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He is a full professor at the Institute of Pharmaceutical Chemistry at the University of Pax. He has published over a hundred articles. He's an author of a book too, editor of two books, co-author of nine book chapters, and an ed editor-in-chief for the Journal of Pharmaceutical and Biopharmaceutical Research. Professor Paul, thank you again very much for being here and for being so kind uh, and having accepted the invitation to be here with us. It is an honor having you here. So, feel free to start your lecture when you want. Thank you very much. I do thank you very much for this very kind of invitation. First of all, uh, in the introductory part, we were talking about my association with the, uh, your university, which is fairly close, on the field of uh, reactions of charcoal. Uh, with different uh, tile uh, substances. Other, all the two PhD students who graduated in my and uh, Professor Parida's uh, joint uh, 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 tutoring has uh, uh, got very good results, uh, continuously publishing, and I, I, I very, very, uh, 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 how to say, it's, uh, it, 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 it was my really great pleasure to have guest researchers from Brazil and uh, keep this content alive. So thank you again for the invitation. Uh, my two days lecture, I do hope that uh, it's visible soon. I, uh, I Not guess. yet, Professor. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, maybe I have to do something here. No? Maybe we have to wait for it. Um, should 
I do something or make? My lecture is open. I mean, the PT is open now. It's on the screen. So I'm waiting for your colleague to, to okay. share the screen. Okay. Okay, so, Gustavo, can you can you yeah. help us? Or just ask him to Gustavo e, Gustavo is saying, Professor Paul, just just open your PowerPoint. Yes, it's it's open now. It's open. And uh, start the did you share your screen with us? Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Now it's gonna work. Uh, okay. You so so you can see the. Uh... Yes, I can see your screen, but not your presentation. Yeah, that's that's my that's my problem. So it's it's uh, it's on the screen, and uh, my. Uh, now it is okay, Professor. Is it okay now. Yes, oh, it was okay. It was. It was. <laughs> how about how about now? Okay, nice. It's it's okay now. Yes, it is okay. Yeah. So, let's go. Can just go professor, to... just yeah. put on full screen, please. Uh, this way. Not yet. Just put to show in full screen, entire screen. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. It is full screen now. Yes, now it's perfect, Professor. Thank you. So we can go? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So, as in my introductory discussion with Manuel, Professor... Manuel, I was uh, uh, I was uh, talking about uh, a, a, a sort of flavonoid charcons, which, is open, which are open chain precursors of uh, this uh, important natural product, and uh, this lecture concentrates on on the potential use of uh, charcon derivatives as antiviral, uh, anti SARS in particular agents. Uh, Let's uh, start my lecture with uh, with uh, some some statistics. If we have uh, a look at this figure, we can see some important uh, uh, figures of uh, of uh, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. First of all, I just uh, just uh, uh, mentioned two figures. So the global uh, cases in May was 156 million and uh, 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 the global death was uh, let's say 3.3 million people and uh, according to the two days uh, figures both cases uh, went up uh, statistically different way so the total case is now is 250 million all together and uh, the total death is five million people it's a lot it's 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 a it's a huge number it's uh, unbelievable in the beginning of the 21st century but this is the case no uh, at the beginning of my lecture i wish to tell some details of the virus we do not have enough time to to, uh, to uh, uh, discuss all the details. So I will concentrate only those particulars which are related to the uh, Chalcon's possible antiviral uh, uh, application. Uh, the, the, classical, the classical classification of viruses, what I've learned when I was pharmacy student a long time ago, is like this. Namely, we can distinguish DNA viruses and RNA viruses. And among the RNA viruses, there are different uh, 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 two, two different uh, uh, classes in uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase or with reverse tra uh, transcriptase activities. Which, uh, um, coronaviruses belong to this last one. It's 
I think it's well known now all over the world. And uh, this is a very simplified structure of the compound, just recalling some important proteins and uh, 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 which plays important role in the development of the disease. And uh, uh, of course, plays important uh, uh, role, uh, uh, represent important target for possible antiviral therapy. So it's a single strain positive sense RNA is the genetic material of the, uh, of the, of the virus, which is associated with the nuclear protein and, uh, and the glycoprotein, the so-called spike uh, protein. And uh, sometimes uh, ham agglutinin asterase proteins are also found in, in some uh, sort of, uh, of uh, SARS and MARS. Uh, virus. A new uh, class of classification of viruses is uh, uh, as the so-called Baltimore scheme, which uh, distinguishes seven different classes of uh, viruses based on the more uh, 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 precisely specified uh, class of the genetic material. And uh, among uh, this one, uh, we can we, we will find uh, the, uh, the coronaviruses as uh, the among the single strain uh, RNA uh, viruses. Let's see what does it mean. The positive sense uh, single strand RNA, uh, which uh, is the viral genome of, uh, of uh, the current viruses can use their genome directly as a messenger. So it, it, uh, it, it means that as soon as the, uh, the, the genetic material is released in the host cell, it can, uh, uh, it can act as, uh, as, uh, as a code for uh, translation on, by the host liposome to synthesize the necessary New viral proteins and as for replication of the genetic material of the of the virus uh, at uh, uh, it use uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase or RNA replicase which creates a negative strand RNA and uh, this is uh, converted to the positive strand RNA by the RNA dependent RNA polymerase Again, and that way, uh, uh, both the viral protein and both the genetic material can be replicated. So uh, before before we, uh, I I we wish to go into details of the antiviral therapy. I wish to tell some words about the immunization, which is obviously the most effective antiviral therapy at that moment. And the reason why I, I go up with these few slides uh, incorporated into my lecture is that uh, one of the most successful uh, line of uh, immunization is, has got the Hungarian link. Now, briefly, uh, uh, all the the uh, vaccines that are used nowadays are uh, uh, affect uh, or produce the so-called active immunization. And uh, this uh, 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 different kind of uh, vaccines uh, stimulate proliferation of the T and the B cells, a resulting formation of a factor producing antibodies and memory uh, B cells, as it's known as the basic uh, uh, immunology. And the formation of these memory cells is the basis of, for the relative permanent effects of vaccination, which is under question now. And, and, uh, and actually, we are in the developmental phase uh, uh, concerning this sort of this uh, aspect of the, uh, this immunization. There are a lot of different vaccines developed so far earlier 
uh, not to mention those ones which are uh, uh, particularly developed uh, to uh, obtain uh, immunity against uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, too. And uh, in this lecture, I wish only to send some, tell some words about the messenger RNA vaccine. The messenger RNA vaccine uh, is, uh, to, to, the to the best of my knowledge and to my opinion, is the most successful uh, uh, vaccination uh, at this moment. The messenger RNA vaccines make protein, the, the spike protein, and to trigger an immune response. But what was the difficulties of this project? There, there were a lot. Uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, difficulties is the well-known instability of the RNA. Uh, this instability was uh, overcome by uh, a simple chemical transformation of the uridine unit of the uh, coded uh, 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 RNA to the, the so-called pseudo-uridine uh, uh, unit. This, these two uh, uh, compounds only differ in the uh, linking position of the uh, ribose unit to uh, the heterocyclic ring, namely in the natural uridine, this is an N-glycosidal uh, uh, link linkage, which uh, makes its instability, which is, can be improved by eliminating this 2 hydroxyl. However, in pseudo-uridine, uh, as we can see, the, uh, the uracil unit is linked to the uh, ribose uh, uh, unit through a carbon carbon bond. That was one of the invention, uh, 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 I, one of the most important invention that the two scientists, Dr. Carido and Dr. Weissman, uh, uh, developed. And there is a very uh, good uh, review, recent review in Nature, about uh, uh, all the other details of uh, this uh, development. The other important feature is the lipid uh, 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 layer of the nanoparticles which, uh, in, into which uh, this RNA is incorporated. This lipid layer uh, consists of four different li uh, lipids. Among them, uh, uh, the ionizable lipid uh, part plays a very important role. So uh, as a result of these two uh, 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 improvement findings, uh, uh, it could it could uh, obtain a useful medicine right now, uh, which can uh, get into the cells, uh, uh, keeping the uh, uh, RNA uh, stable, and not to recognize the the macromolecule. As antigen, so this two uh, as uh, as a result of these two these two uh, the development, the circle, you are very much familiar. So I do not repeat all the details now. Is working, and uh, uh, the the vaccine is is uh, uh, is safe, and to the best of my knowledge, these two chemical physical chemical uh, uh, development could result in a successful uh, drug development uh, uh, project. As for the anti-SARS-CoV-2 strategies, there are, uh, there, uh, uh, it's also a very wide uh, topic. So obviously I will just uh, pick up one segment of the, the different strategies uh, which are uh, related to uh, uh, the targets that can be attacked by charcoal. So if we, we look at the, uh, the simplified uh, uh, mechanism of replication of viruses that distinguishes the six more important uh, uh, steps, uh, you, you might know 
that uh, almost all the important steps can be uh, inhibited by different uh, chemicals, different uh, drugs in different uh, viruses. So, uh, for example, the entrance uh, inhibitors uh, uh, involving the, the uh, ICA uh, uh, enzyme in the surface of the lung cells, for example, uh, is also uh, an important feature. We heard uh, about this uh, uh, topic uh, lecture yesterday. The, uh, uh, the uncoating can also be uh, uh, inhibited uh, by uh, different heterocyclic stops, which are uh, which were uh, uh, very uh, useful. Looks very loose, useful at the very beginning. Afterwards, they uh, turned out uh, to have uh, several side effects, and the replication uh, uh, could also uh, be uh, uh, inhibited by different uh, ways. Now, as for the possible anti-COVID therapies, from the point of view of Charlton's, are those enzymes and uh, uh, the spike protein itself, uh, uh, which are uh, Coded in the genomic organization of the COVID uh, viruses. So the catalytic enzymes, uh, if, uh, uh, sites of these enzymes, it would be a suitable target for antiviral therapy because they are highly conserved, similar to the sequence corresponding to the SARS and the MERS uh, uh, COVID. Yeah. You might know the, the story, the MERS uh, uh, viruses were identified uh, several years ago. So this uh, uh, project uh, is, uh, is underway from 15, 20 years, uh, and uh, which, which, was, which, which was accelerated by the pandemic caused by the COVID-19. Now let's see some essentials of the Chalcons themselves. The Chalcons have got uh, three different uh, important units. As you can see uh, from this uh, biochemical pathway, this is an open chain uh, uh, transitional uh, uh, compound of uh, uh, synthesis of different flavon uh, flavonoids, like flavonan. And uh, we can distinguish three different uh, important uh, parts of the compound two aromatic rings whose uh, relative position is very determining and the polar carbon-carbon double bond and uh, the polarization of this carbon-carbon double bond is due to the conjugated carbon unit. So this unit is called the anon unit of the, of the, uh, the charcons as, a, as a, a third or second. Several reviews uh, uh, appeared in the last five, six, ten years uh, on the different antimicrobial, chemopreventive, anti-cancer, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, agents. Some of them was written by uh, uh, researchers uh, working in, in uh, uh, University of Goyas. Uh, and uh, among them, I wish to uh, uh, highlight only those three, which are uh, highlighted in red, namely the antiviral effects of uh, natural and synthetic uh, chalcons, uh, the, uh, the possibility of modulation of enzymes involved ex activation and conjugation of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, electrophilic uh, particles, for example, carcinogens, and the anti-inflammatory effect uh, uh, you know, you might know that uh, the, the most typical uh, uh, clinical symptoms of uh, the COVID-19 is, uh, 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 is uh, among, among them, you can find the inflammation, I mean, uh, the inflammation of the lung. In, in this respect, no, we concentrate on these two, how these two effects could be uh, 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 effect, uh, inhibited by one particular uh, set of compounds. No, uh, 
uh, this review, very good one, uh, uh, refers several compounds, uh, 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 several charcoal, charcoal derivatives with the uh, uh, potential antiviral activities. Now we can uh, uh, we just uh, I be concentrating on the anti-COVID activity, and this anti-COVID activity of the charcoals are related uh, of uh, their inhibitory potential of the cysteine protein. Uh, uh, the cysteine proteinases are important enzymes in in the in the uh, uh, source. Uh, uh, I mean the. Uh, 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 virus replication since the genome encodes two polyproteins and these polyproteins are cleaved to different fractions of proteins by a papain like cysteine protease and the chemotrypsin like cysteine protease and uh, uh, obviously uh, the, the normal function of these two protein uh, proteinases are essential for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, develop uh, the application of the virus. This is the mechanism of the cysteine proteinases. Uh, 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 chemistry, stereochemistry, we just concentrating on, on this one. So splitting the, uh, the acid amide bound, the peptide bound, uh, needs a, a, a nucleophilic sulfur, which is, uh, which is deprotonated by the, uh, by the histidine residue and this deprotonated nucleophilic attack, a sulfurous attack, is the initial step of uh, this hydrolytic process. So there are several covalently bound inhibitors used as uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2M uh, uh, enzymes. And if you have a closer look of them, they also uh, have a, a anon unit. I mean the polarized uh, carbon carbon double bond, which can attack the sulfur. Uh, so the thiol react among the thiol reactive compounds, uh, uh, besides this uh, semi-synthetic stuff, there are plenty a lot of uh, or, already known uh, uh, compounds. For example, uh, here is the isulfiram, uh, effectively used uh, in treatment of alcoholics. Or uh, the seleno uh, uh, compound epsilon, which were also uh, introduced uh, with great expectations 30, 40, 30, 40 years ago. And uh, among the, uh, the bioactive derivatives against this uh, uh, protease, uh, the literature lists several cyclic chalcon derivatives. So if you have a closer look at this, this molecule, for example, and you uh, mentally eliminate this unit, you can find the chalcon uh, uh, compound, which is uh, linked to, uh, by a linker, uh, can be formed a six-membered ring derivative, a five-membered ring derivative, or an open chain uh, derivative, which were uh, 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 theoretically and experimentally uh, effective against uh, this virus. The other side, the anti in, uh, 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 in, inflammatory reaction of, uh, of child forms, among other possible pathways, is also related to the reaction of the act, uh, uh, activated carbon uh, uh, carbon dump, uh, uh, double bound with a thiol function of different uh, proteins. This reaction, when the thiol is added to the activated double bond, is called nuclear reaction. So that's uh, the process is nuclear addition, fairly effective even in non spontaneous uh, ways. So the two. Uh, a different uh, uh, pathway that could uh, lead to uh, an uh, anti inflammatory effect is the PEEP1 and uh, NRF2 uh, complex and the NF kappa B uh, 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 complex. Both of them uh, have uh, accessible 
thiol fraction rate it is. And if uh, uh, in a redox reaction or the alkylating reaction, you modify uh, these uh, free thiols, uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, can uh, activate uh, uh, this uh, pathway, which results in, in the nucleus uh, synthesis of uh, different antioxidant uh, uh, enzymes. And the other thing uh, is that uh, the nf kappa b pathway, which is uh, activated uh, uh, by uh, IK, IK, IKK. However, if you modify, chemically modify the free uh, uh, nf kappa b thiolate, uh, this uh, uh, release, the normal release of, uh, uh, of this uh, DNF alpha, IL6, IL8, and uh, uh, INOS, for example, just to mention a few uh, uh, in, uh, uh, inflammatory, pro inflammatory agents is blocked. So, in our, uh, uh, or uh, during our experiments, we are dealing with uh, open chain charcons and several cyclic charcons with uh, differently substituted uh, aromatic rings and, uh, and the, at the redox active paracetamol uh, ring. And uh, based on these uh, 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 literature data, we started the systematic uh, 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 testing with the National uh, Virology Laboratory, which is part of the University of Page, uh, of, uh, of, of different uh, charcons and different uh, charcon analogs with the hope uh, finding uh, uh, of, uh, effective uh, compounds, which probably uh, have got dual effects. Uh, what can we do from chemical point of view? Uh, uh, sulfur atom is rich in electrons. It means that uh, the electron deficiency of this beta carbon and the stability of the product, the, uh, the intermediate, determines the, uh, the, uh, the rate of the reaction and the position of the uh, equilibrium. So if we compare uh, the uh, uh, the open chain charcons and the, the cyclic analogs with different uh, uh, ring size, we can see that uh, the most uh, reactive compounds against the thiol uh, derivatives are the indanon and the open chain called charcon derivatives, you see, and the six member and the seven member derivatives are less uh, uh, effective. The other physical chemical property that we could also tune uh, by means of uh, introducing the substituents and the changing the, uh, uh, the, the ring size is the lipophilic character of the compound. You can see here that, uh, uh, first of all, if you change the substituent, the log P values are changing. And if you are changing the ring size, the log P value uh, is increasing as long as the uh, number of carbon CH3 units are increasing. And the third uh, uh, aspect that we could also modify is the stereochemistry of this enon uh, uh, unit, which could be uh, 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 so called E or uh, so called Z, depending on the relative position of the, of the, of the uh, let's say, aromatic ring in respect to the oxygen atom. This, uh, this uh, uh, configuration or change could also, as we can see, uh, statistically uh, uh, modify the lock P of the compound. So uh, 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 we, we are studying and uh, uh, it's underway uh, of, uh, uh, of the reactivity of uh, glutathione as a model to thiol and at the same time is uh, found in very high concentration in the cytosols. And we could see that uh, uh, the, uh, the reactivity of the compounds really uh, uh, determined by the substituents and on the ring size. 
of of uh, of of, uh, of the, the cyclic charge. So these are the these are the possibilities, uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, these changing are we are investigating, uh, uh, finding, searching for uh, 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 some kind of uh, uh, relationship between the physical chemical properties and the biological action, namely the uh, anti-COVID action of this, uh, this type of compounds. So as uh, a summary of my present uh, uh, presentation is that the child phones are versatile structures from medicinal chemistry point of view, tuning the physical chemical characteristics of the four, four child phone structure can increase the specificity and the binding to the several micromolecules by means of proper substitution of the aromatic rings, the electrophilicity of the beta carbon can be tuned synthesis of cyclic derivatives with different ring size. Both characteristics uh, can be properly modified and virus proteases are promising target of the SARS-CoV and to the best of our knowledge, the dual acting Chalcon derivatives represent a new class of antiviral therapy. Briefly, this is our most important uh, knowledge about this topic now, and uh, thank you, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Professor Paul. Very interesting lecture. We have some questions from 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 our YouTube channel. Let me yes. see. Just a minute, so, I could try to get back to the... Okay. Professor Professor James is saying okay. thanks. I'm here okay. again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Professor James James is saying thanks a lot for the brilliant presentation, Paul. This is a very important contribution as the world is witnessing the first Britain approved Merck's COVID-19 pill. It's a comment. And he's asking, do you consider anti-COVID-19 screening of Chalcon analogues interesting? Excuse me, may I? I, I just uh, close the window and since uh, I did not exactly hear your question, I'm very sorry. Okay, I, I'm going to say again. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> no, no problem, Could Professor. You please repeat the question, please. Yes, I'm going to read again, no problem. Professor James is asking, do you consider anti-COVID-19 screening of Chalcon analogues interesting? Of course, anyway, we wouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, 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 actually, uh, the screening is not our job. So I don't know whether it, it, it's interesting or not. I mean, I'm I mean, the approach is challenging to, uh, to, to, uh, to the West of our knowledge. So what we are knowing now with, uh, in, in, with cooperation with the theoreticians is uh, to find the overlapping structural features of the anti-inflammatory chalcons and the antiviral chalcons uh, with the same mechanism of action, namely uh, uh, on the same uh, thiol reactivity. This is, this is a, a work at the moment in progress with uh, uh, some of your colleagues and some colleagues at the at, uh, uh, at, uh, 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 Univ Evangelica. Uh, I think you know Dr. Hamilton and, uh, and his colleagues. So no, this is a joint project uh, uh, between us, and uh, we are just synthesizing derivatives of oh, Metzger uh, and uh, 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 give them to the National Virology Laboratory for testing. And at the same time, we are accumulating the uh, uh, the, uh, the knowledge from the theoreticians 
and uh, uh, we are listening to the advice how to modify the structure since it's obvious that the carbon charcoal core should be decorated uh, to get uh, specificity yes uh, pro professor jacqueline alves thanks uh, for your nice talk She's asking, has your group been studying other secondary meta metabolites with the potential to inhibit coronavirus replication? Unfortunately, not, not really. So uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, this Chalcon project is uh, originated from my, let's say, PhD uh, studies, uh, uh, so very old. And uh, at the beginning, uh, honestly speaking, I was uh, uh, by uh, uh, tutoring of, of my of my uh, uh, my uh, older uh, professors on the stereochemistry and the mechanism of the thiol addition on activated double bond, which is, uh, is it, which is an important feature from from theoretical point of view as well. We can't know this uh, afterwards with the. Uh, with uh, studying the reaction with the spontaneous and the glutathion transferase catalyzed reaction of the compounds uh, uh, in different uh, in vitro and, uh, uh, and in vivo uh, conditions. And this project is a relatively new one. It's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, uh, reaction of the charcoals with protein tiles. Uh, uh, so, as, as you can see, this is a kind of uh, line of development of, of, uh, of uh, my and my colleagues' research. And now having the HPSCMS facility in, in our laboratory, uh, we can, uh, we, we, would, we would find interesting to, uh, to analyze and we, we, uh, we, we investigate how the charcoals react with these protein uh, tiles. Uh, what are the, 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 the structural and the kinetic and the thermodynamic feature of the reaction of this, uh, this uh, 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 compound with this uh, uh, protein ions. But so just to answer uh, uh, the question, unfortunately not, we are just dealing with culture. But uh, uh, in, this, in, in the faculty, uh, there, are, there, are, there is a, a pharmacognosy uh, research group who are dealing with other problems in charcoal. Okay. Uh, Ericlis Mesquita, he, he thanks for the lecture. He's saying it was very interesting. Um, he says, I'd like to ask if chalcon derivatives have any antioxidant pathways that could inhibit the coronavirus replication. Yes, uh, uh, the hydroxylated charcoals in particular, among the hydroxylated uh, charcoals in particular, uh, there are very effective antioxidants. Uh, but this antioxidant effect is, uh, how to say, it? it's rather non-specific, since, uh, since uh, uh, if you apply with different pathways. There are, of course, the pharmaceutical technology can uh, solve very, uh, 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 can provide very nice solution to, to targeted uh, different tissues, different organs in this respect. Uh, 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 however, uh, uh, the antioxidant effect is, uh, how to say, uh, you are a biologist, uh, you know, uh, generation of uh, uh, the, so, so antioxidant effect is a very wide term. Uh, 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 this uh, this hydroxylated uh, charcoals are uh, radical scavengers. Typically, so uh, that's the main biological effect of its. No, that's the main uh, molecular uh, 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 mechanism of their antioxidant effects. Other antioxidant effects can be resulted in in very much different ways so if uh, uh, dr mesquita is thinking on the uh, uh, 
hydroxyl or anoid radical uh, scavenging effect of hydroxylated carbons, I can tell that yes, they are they are fairly among them. There are fairly effective ones. Uh, however, formation of these uh, reactive ox oxygen species is somehow down in the in the in, in the mechanism, which leads to uh, to oxidative stress. So this is uh, so if you if you uh, if you uh, go up in the in the mechanistic uh, uh, pathway, I we guess we have a better uh, solution to prevent uh, uh, the coronavirus caused uh, 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 inflammation in the lung. Okay, Professor Paul. Again, unfortunately, we we don't have time for more questions because okay, we have yeah. to. Okay, no question. problem. We can continue next time. <laughs> yes. Thank you again, Professor, you. for for being so kind and for uh, having with us during our meeting. Thank you again. Thank I, you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I, I send my best regards to all the colleagues who I'm, I'm familiar with at your university. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you. I also would like to, to, to thank all our invited speakers um, of this session. Thank you very much. So now we are going to have a break for lunch and we'll be back soon for the next section at 2 p.m. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jacqueline. So see you soon. See you. <laughs>